Here are the announcements for Pentecost 19. Starting on October 9th, Saturday night at 6 service, we'll move indoors to the upper room. We're running into darkness. Please use the red doors by the office entrance in the back of the church and proceed up the stairs. The elevator will be available for those who need it. Please bring a mask to wear. In the uh, and remember that masks are always required anytime you're inside the building at Advent. We'll be holding it the annual Blessing of the Pets this Sunday, October 3rd at 4.30 on the front lawn of the church. All pets are welcome to come for a blessing. Please keep all dogs and cats on leashes and keep smaller animals in cages or crates. If your pet does not travel well, you can bring a picture to have your pet blessed in absentia. We ask that everyone bring a donation of pet food to go to a local shelter. The annual Burke's Reading Crop Walk will be held on October 10th at Grings Mill. If you would like to join our team or make a donation to sponsor one of our walkers, uh, please click on the link in the description in the box below the video. To donate by check, Please make your check payable to Advent Lutheran Church with Crop Walk 2021 in the memo line. Questions? Please contact our Director of Ministries, Kathy Raphael. For this year's Harvest Home celebration, the Social Ministry Committee is asking for donations to our free little pantry in the front of the church uh, that we have outside. We are looking for non-perishable items to offer our neighbors. Donations can be dropped off at the church office during regular hours, or you can bring them during uh, worship times at church. All donations are due by October 31st. Sunday school and catechetical classes are sponsoring a clothing drive and book drive to benefit the Pre-K Counts program. We're asking for donations of hats and mittens and gloves for preschool aged children. New underwear and new pants in sizes four and five for boys and girls, and new or gently used board books. All clothing donations are due by November 7th, and all book donations are due by December 12th. The Evangelism Committee is sponsoring their annual fall and winter clothing drive to benefit Common Ground Recovery Program and the Hope Rescue Mission. We are asking for donations of winter, warm winter clothing, including sweatshirts and sweatpants, boots and shoes, no fancy shoes, please, sneakers, coats, jacks, hats, gloves, and scarves. All donations are due to the church by October 31st. We are seeking a new financial secretary, formerly known as a bookkeeper. The duties will take approximately two hours a week and there is an annual stipend. If you or someone you know is interested in the position, please contact Becca in the church office for more information. If you or your family member is sick or hospitalized or in need of pastoral care, please contact me through the church office. And of course, if someone dies, please let us know so that we can offer the pastoral care for that occasion. All right, hello everybody. Uh, I'm Joy France uh, on the Stewardship Committee. I'm gonna be talking to you for a couple of Sundays leading up to Commitment Sunday, which is October 17th. So you may or may not have noticed in our newsletters that we are having, um, there's been some words and articles about stewardship leading up to uh, our campaign here in October. And so uh, I would like to, bear with me, I'm gonna go through my mail because at the bottom of my pile, there's something that all of us are gonna get in the mail, and so I just wanted to talk about it. So first I have, a, I have a reminder to vote, which is excellent, we shall vote. All right, next I have a mound of coupons. I'm not really a coupon girl, but those will be good for somebody. I got my newsletter, my October newsletter from Advent, so I'll look at that at another time. That's not what I'm interested in today. What I'm interested in is this one. So the Stewardship Committee has mailed all the members a, uh, a little packet. So that's what we're gonna open today. So let's open 
our packet and see what we got. All right. So, first we have a letter from Pastor. So everyone gets to read the lovely words of Pastor encouraging us all to think about stewardship, just like our articles in the newsletter have been encouraging us to think about stewardship and what that means for us. And at the bottom, I want you to notice that there is what looks like a commitment card. And so this is the letter, the commitment card part that you're gonna keep at home. So you're gonna keep the letter, you're gonna fill this out, and I would love for you to just stick this on your fridge or file it somewhere where you know where to look for it. Um, but this one's for your records, okay? And then there is this one, which everybody's gonna get in there as well. And this is the one that you're gonna return to us somehow. I would love it. If you brought it back on October 17th on Commitment Sunday, that would be lovely. We're going to have several locations um, for you to drop it off uh, throughout the service. Uh, if you are not going to be able to make it or you forget or what have you, or you just want to get on the ball and get it in early, that would be great too. There is a self-addressed envelope in there as well. So feel free to pop it in the mail and Becca will get it when it arrives at the, at the office. Um, so that's my reminder. So I hope everybody looks for their packet. I got mine today. Maybe you got yours today too. Maybe it's coming, but that's what it's gonna look like when you get it. If you forget your commitment card, don't worry because we will have extras printed on the day of Commitment Sunday. And we will certainly be accepting them uh, the several Sundays after that. So we encourage you to do some prayerful thinking and think about how you might want to give back to the church this year. Thank you, I look forward to seeing you on October 17th. Bye. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Sovereign God, you have created us to live in loving community with one another. Form us for your life that is faithful and steadfast, and teach us to trust like little children, that we may reflect the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. 
The first reading is from the second chapter of Genesis. The Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all cattle and to all the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for the man, there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. Word of God, word of life. Second reading is from the first chapter of Hebrews. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom we also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now God did not subject the coming world about which we are speaking to angels, but someone had testified somewhere, what are human beings that that you are mindful of them, or mortals, that you care for them? You have made them for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowded them with glory and honor, subjecting all things under their feet. Now in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them, but we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are are sanctified all have one Father. 
For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Word of God, word of life. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Some Pharisees came, and to test Jesus, they asked him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. For from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house with the disciples, the disciples asked him again about this matter. Jesus said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order to, that they might touch him, that he might touch them, and the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me and do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms and laid his hands on them and bless them. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, this passage is one of those passages which would be the subject of a book I would like to write someday on things I wish Jesus hadn't said. Oh, Jesus, you make me talk about divorce and adultery and problems in the text. So, here we go. The first thing we have to know about this reading in the Gospel of Mark is what it says in the first verse that we read. Some Pharisees came out to test him. This is all about the Pharisees trying to trap Jesus. They were always trying to find a way to get him in trouble. And so they ask him about this sensitive issue. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And of course it is lawful. And so they just want a yes or no answer from Jesus. <laughs> and he doesn't get that. And he says, what does Moses say? And he says, well, they do. He says that you can do that. And then they say, uh, he can do, they can do that. And, and yes, a man can divorce his wife. In fact, the law of Moses in Deuteronomy 24, look it up or you can listen to me read it now. Deuteronomy 24, it says, Suppose a man enters into marriage with a woman, but she does not please him because he finds something objectionable about her. And so he writes her a certificate of divorce places it in her hand, and sends her out of his house 
she leaves, she then leaves his house. That's divorce. As you know, it was a patriarchal society, all male dominated. Women were considered nothing more or less than property. And if she does something that does not please him, or he finds something objectionable about her, he writes a certificate of divorce, places it in her hand, and she's out the door. That's it. And so, yes, it's permitted to divorce someone if you go by that rule, which is pretty hardness of heart. It is abuse, really, of a human relationship for the sake of the law. And Jesus knows that the trap here is that he is being called to task for a law that really is abusive to women. But the Pharisees want to see if he'll go that far. And then he says, from the beginning, they were male and female, and they came together, and God did that. Don't let anybody separate it. So is he saying, don't ever divorce? What he's saying is what God does is more important is what the, than what the law says. Because I don't think he disallows divorce. We know that he knew of divorced people. In fact, he goes on with the disciples in an inside the house and talks about this issue again. And this is very interesting because we know that in the law of Moses, women had no rights for divorce. But he goes on to, to quote another law. Pardon me, I just dropped my script. Another law that, that we may not be familiar with. He says, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And, who, and if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. What's this? She divorces her husband? Well, yes, that was allowed in the Greek and Roman law, not the Jewish law. So Jesus is expanding the conversation beyond Mosaic or Jewish law to the Greco-Roman law when he says if she, if either one, if he divorces her to marry another or if she divorces him to marry another, it's adultery. Now, you know what an, an arranged marriage is. This is the way it was in the first century. Families would get together. Your son, my daughter, they're going to marry. And it really wasn't up to the people who were in the marriage to have a choice in the marriage. They had to do what the family said. It's no wonder that some wound up in divorce. But beside that point, at the point at which the marriage over the years has turned into something that was not manageable, there were times when men would look at each other's wives and say, well, what do you think? If I divorce my wife with a certificate of divorce, how about you do the same and then we can kind of marry each other's wife? We could do it legally. Imagine that. Abusing the law. Using the law for your own ends. I'm sure nobody ever does that. Do you know about tax law? Anyway, you've got a sense of what's going on here. And Jesus is saying in the Greco-Roman world, where even the woman has the chance to do this, it's wrong. It is wrong. It's an arranged divorce. It's an arranged divorce. It's like, if I manage this, would you manage that for me? Let's do this. Let's take an arrangement. This is not right. This is abuse on a grand scale. It's not fair in relationship to each other or any other person. 
And that's what this story is all about. It's about relationship. Relationship to each other and relationship to God. Jesus says to the Pharisees, basically, don't argue with me about law, about each other. Let me tell you about what God is doing in the midst of your argument. You've got an illustration, not in the 21st century divorce law context. And we need to be careful about this because this is not about how we understand the tragic consequences and situation of divorce, which many, many of you and many of us have had to deal with. So this passage, strangely, but not surprisingly, goes back to the children again. You've got this whole thing where they're trying to trap Jesus and Jesus is trying to deal with uh, people's misfired notions of divorce and relationships. And now we go back to the children. People are bringing their children to Jesus to, so that he may touch them. And the disciples sternly speak to them. In other words, get them away from him. They don't want Jesus to touch these kids. Why is this? Well, when we think of Jesus and the children, we usually think of those wonderful Sunday school pictures that we saw when we were growing up with Jesus and the squeaky clean children who gathered around him in a beautiful countryside photo, you know. No, 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 no. If people are bringing their children for Jesus to touch, they're looking for help. They're looking for healing. These children are sick. Think not about the beautiful Sunday school pictures. Think about children in an emergency waiting room, bleeding, sniffling, hardly breathing having some kind of problem that nobody understands. These kids need healing. And Jesus' touch is a healing touch. But the disciples don't want this because that is unclean to touch someone who was ill. Huh. But they still don't understand Jesus. Because the illness doesn't jump over to Jesus, the healing jumps from Jesus to the child. And that's why people would bring people to their children to Jesus. And he took them in his arms. Think of that. The ch child who is so ill. If you've ever had a child who's ill and has a fever, they feel like they're burning up. Jesus would take them in his arms and bless them and the fever would leave them unless you come to Jesus as a child with the pain and the suffering and the aches and the illness you really don't come And isn't it often that we finally get to that place where we reach out to Jesus in the worst parts and he's there? And isn't one of the worst parts the difficulty of human pain through our own suffering, which we often bring upon ourselves in relationship to each other? The second part of this gospel lesson is the corrective to the first part. Once again, the disciples don't get it. They're speaking sternly to people who are in desperate need of healing. Once again, the Pharisees are just trying to trap Jesus because they don't care about the pain and the human struggle of divorce. They're worried about the law. But 
Jesus says, unless you come with that pain, unless you come to me as a child, you, can, you don't come to the kingdom. This is the message of the gospel for us today. Whether our pain is because of human frailties and frailings, whether our pain is because of sorrow or stress or, pain, or just pain itself, we need the touch of Jesus in our lives, and we have it. It's an old story about a woman who was really struggling and she visited a friend and she said to her friend, I've asked Jesus to touch me and I haven't had any success. I just feel all alone. And her friend said, well, just bow your head, close your eyes and ask Jesus to lay his hands on you. She said, okay. And she does that. She prays. And as she prayed, she felt something of hands on her shoulder. And she finished her prayer and looked up, and her friend had put her hands on her friend's shoulders. And she said, Oh, it was you all along. And her friend said to her, Jesus uses the closest pair of hands. Pray that Jesus may lay his hands, whether it be your friend or just the reception of your prayer or the conversation and consolation of your friends. That Jesus touch you right where you hurt. Because this is how God comes to us in the pain that we find in our lives sometimes. His peace be with you. Amen.
let us profess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the whole Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Holy One, you have raised up faithful leaders throughout history. Empower those discerning a call to ministry and all seminarians, that they, especially John, as he pursues his, his seminary education at Lancaster, that they may continue to be formed for the sake of the gospel. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You have established a diverse and beautiful creation. Revive declining species and preserve endangered lands. Cultivate in us a wonder for the world you created. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You desire for us not to be alone and to live in community with one another. Strengthen relationships between nations and peoples that we may celebrate and support one human family. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You share in our experiences and struggles. Bless all who live with any mental or physical disability. Inspire creative communities, spaces, and environments that are accessible and hospitable. We pray for your loving embrace for all who are sick today, especially those we name before you now. Place your healing hands on them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You have established and nurtured relationships that extend beyond those gathered today. Bless members who can no longer travel to worship and remind us of their continued role in this community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your Holy Spirit guides your church. Inspire our bishops, Elizabeth and Christopher, Provide direction for the congregations of the West Berks Mission District, especially for Pastor Jennifer D., the church council, and other leaders and members of Trinity Lutheran Church in Robasonia as they serve in your name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You promise eternal life to all your children. Thank you for the people of faith who have gone before us. Strengthen our trust that we, that we have in you, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Receive these prayers and those in our hearts known only to, new, to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. People of God, you are Christ's body, new life in a suffering world. The Holy Trinity, one God, 
bless you now and forever in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. The living word dwells in you. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you.